Good evening, everyone. Here I am, Rana Bas. Again, we are live. I am live from Dubai, and today I am live with Professor C.K. Hoang. So he's a well-known bariatric surgeon and really live legend at the globe. So long time, uh, personally, I know Professor C.K. Hoang, and most of you, you know his, uh, especially his participation in promoting bariatric surgery, metabolic surgery. It's great honor to interview such a prestigious figure. As my viewers, you know, we have started this interview series with MGB OAGB. That was for six months. Then safe sleep gastrectomy. Again, it was six months, and we had a, a sum up session. Then Ruan Mayer. Now we have started metabolic surgery in low BMI diabetic patients, and it's great honor for me to have Professor C K Wang. And sir, so much thanks to accept our invitation. Sir, over to you. Hi, how are you, everyone? Uh, nice to meet you in the, even right now it's the night of Taiwan. So uh, I want to thank uh, the global laparoscopic and uh, robotics uh, to give me the chance to talk with you in, this, uh, in the sky. And thanks uh, Professor Imran your invitation. I think we know each other for a long time and we have been very good friends. So it's my first time to uh, send my, my regards here to you and hope my uh, talk today could help everyone, uh, especially for young surgeons to learn uh, bariatric and metabolic surgery in this field. Thank you. Sir, so many thanks. And really, it's great honor for mine to have such a a great person in touch. Sir, as you know, so our questions are in three parts. In first part, we will talk about your brief and personally, I know, but overall our viewers are so interested because this interview is just in light mood. This is not like a webinar. So we will talk with each other. We will also take some questions from our viewers. Uh, so in first part, this is your brief introduction and also some patient selection and pre-op. Then in second one, we will talk about technical points of your technique. And at the end, we will talk about your results. Sir, we are interested to hear from your side, your brief introduction, your journey of metabolic surgery. And if you want to talk about this. Okay. Uh, first, I introduce myself. Uh, I'm CK Huang from Taiwan. I work in uh, China Medical University Hospitals. Uh, the main campus of this university is in the Taichung city of Taiwan. It's in the center of Taiwan. Uh, I have started uh, bariatric surgery almost 20 years ago. So it has been a very long journey for me. And Tiona, I have performed around 7,000 uh, bariatric cases. So uh, in fact, for me, I myself has been quite experienced in handling these kind of patients. And I also train a lot of fellows uh, mostly from the Asia Pacific area, more than 100 fellows has been trained under me. So uh, I think that I uh, uh, am very keen in uh, education. And also uh, I think uh, the new surgeons need to learn a lot from uh, this new entity of general surgery. So I think this will become a very uh, popular procedures in Asia is uh, what we see in America and uh, European area. So hope everyone can learn it very well. Okay, this is about myself. Sir, so much thanks. Sir, as you know, because now in this era when you are living here in 2022, in my opinion, the real pandemic is diabetes and obesity. There is no doubt. And now this terminology, diabetes is also going to dominant and as all we know that this ASMBS, when they change the name from ASBS to ASMBS, metabolic, they added. So as you know better than me, so we are today, our topic, our interview is about metabolic surgery in low BMI and diabetic patients. Sir, what is your criteria, selection criteria, how you select your diabetic patient with low BMI? Okay, uh, I think right now, as you know that uh, obesity surgery has been very important one that uh, we have uh, doing it for almost these 20 years. In every 
country in the world, I think. So right now, uh, the surgery has been going to another aspect. We call this uh, metabolic surgery. In fact, metabolic surgery has been some definition that we use in the BMI less than 35, but with diabetes. And those BMI more than 35, we call this hysteric surgery. This is the most common definition right now. And uh, in Taiwan, uh, we have bariatric and metabolic surgery uh, society. About five years ago, ago we have uh, uh, published the uh, uh, white papers for the public to talk about what is the criteria to do uh, metabolic surgery. So right now in Taiwan society, we agree with BMI more than 27.5. Those who have type two diabetes with poorly controlled diabetes, then the patient is not type one, should be type two diabetes. Then we can offer uh, surgery uh, for these patients. This could be considered one alternative treatment for the patient. If the BMI more than 32.5 with type two diabetes, we should recommend the patient to receive the surgery. So I think this has been five years in Taiwan. So right now we also have quite numbers of the patient coming for surgery to treat their type two diabetes. So the criteria is more than 27.5, poorly controlled type two diabetes is our criteria. So I'd uh, yeah. yeah, please, please, sir. And in, in fact, in Asia Pacific area, there's in IFSO APC, there's also very similar, this kind of guidelines for BMI more than 27.5 with poorly controlled diabetes, HB1C more than seven, uh, then we can uh, recommend the patient to have this kind of surgery if the diabetes is poorly controlled. So I think right now in Asia Pacific, this has been go to the consensus already. Yeah, so another issue that we see in these patients, because yes, this patient is central obese, but according to the definition, 27.5 above is class one obesity. Uh, so if, but is my question, sometimes these patients are borderline, maybe there is LADA, maybe this is 1.5, not one. Now that we, this is the definition of diabetes and there is autoimmune impact. Uh, so how you, if it's necessary to exclude LADA or uh, type 1.5 in all patients are no, this is not necessary. And you do these lab tests like this, you will check C peptide or serum insulin, fasting or stimulated. Or, I have no idea. We are interested to hear from your side about this, especially lab tests. Okay. Uh, in fact, if uh, type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes is easy to differentiate, mostly less than one year, type 1 diabetes, the patients insulin function goes to very low, the patients start to have insulin. And most of the patients are not obese, mostly they are quite lean, slim, okay? For type two diabetes, mostly they are obese, 80% they are obese. And so say BMI more than 27.5, uh, we, we classify as uh, obesity patient. In fact, they are uh, mostly to be the type two diabetes. But what we worry about is like LADA type, uh, type two diabetes, we classify as 1.5. In fact, the patient also have very quick downhill, the insulin production in five years. So this kind of late onset, we need, we still need to be very careful. Those in the beginning coming to you, the patient is not really uh, obese or during their uh, diabetes progression state. In the beginning of diagnosis, when they are not obese already, you must be very careful. It might be a uh, lot type. The second is about the antibody. In other type, the antibody of the insulin is also more high. So in fact, you have also need to be do some tests for this kind of patient. For our criteria, we should not do surgery in other type and type 1 diabetes patients. Okay, that is our uh, contraindication because even you do the surgery for them, the patient still after one or two years later, they will develop to insulin dependent. So the surgery, in fact, only help them to reduce some weight. But in fact, for the long term, the cost benefit is not there. So mostly we will not recommend surgery, but only one exception for type 1 or type 1.5 diabetes. If the patient is morbid obese, then we do surgery. It's not for their diabetes improvements or resolution. We do the surgery for their obese problems. Yes, yes. Sir, my question, 
So this is the basic question, which test you recommend for any type of metabolic surgery, just patient with BMI 28, 29, and you have diagnosed, yes, this is type two diabetes, patient is 50 years old, now about 10 years suffering with the diabetes and so taking insulin and this is the poor control of diabetes with treatment, which test is compulsory that for all of your patients? Okay. Uh, in fact, not every patient needs to do the antibody test because according to uh, the disease progression process, in fact, you have been able to differentiate except the patient just new onset in five years. And the patient's uh, progression looks very different with type two diabetes. This is number one. Number two is that we regularly check the patients, of course, fasting sugar, postprandial sugar, and HbA1c, including all the uh, obesity, like hyperlipidemia, uh, these uh, parameters. And important is fasting CPAP is very important for us. For those, in fact, if the patient even is morbid obese or non-morbid obese, <laughs> no matter what kind of BMI, if the CPAP is less than one, in fact, we would uh, select this kind of case as contraindication. I don't do surgery on CPAP is less than one because it means the patient's insulin production is very bad already. Except yeah. the patient's morbid obese, but for metabolic surgery patients, C peptidase and one is contraindication for our patient. So it may be type two diabetes long term, or maybe it's a uh, lot type, or maybe it's type one diabetes. But no matter what kind of type this is, C peptidase and one means the patient don't have good pending function already. Even you do surgery, don't have on them in the long term. So it's our contraindication. Sir, this when we check this uh, C peptide fasting C peptide, definite it will be low. Is it compulsory to check uh, stimulated or postprandial in these cases? Is it compulsory? Uh, uh, for me, I don't think it's compulsory. Some surgeons I think that the stimulating C peptide, if after uh, in check, the stimulating C peptide can double it or triple it. It means that the patient still can have a better C peptide function. The patient might be over surgery also. But in fact, if you look at the uh, pancreatic change uh, during the type two diabetes, for those who have pre-diabetes or early onset type two diabetes, less than five years, most fasting C peptide should be more than three. So this is still hyperinsulinemia status. For those less than one, most of you do say the patient cannot get remission for that. And most of this kind of case also have very long duration diabetes or some of them is type two diabetes, but they was diagnosed very late because they did not go to the hospital for early diagnosis. Maybe five years, six years, they did not do any tests. Then suddenly with the severe hyperglycemia go to the hospital or because some operation have the, was found to be very hyperglycemia. So that's what I want to uh, make some notice that if your patient come to you, then you do the checkup, the fasting CPA is less than one. I would really suggest you not to do that. If you really want to consider the patient is type two, you still want to do the surgery, you still need to do the antibody test first. But uh, stimulating C peptide levels, I think is not so worthy that to make a decision whether include a patient for surgery or not. I agree with you. Sir, another question regarding, so if some patients, because personally I face such a situation, huh? patient asks, so uh, about 10 years ago or seven years ago, uh, now he's 50 years old. And at that time I was 90 kg, I was 98 kg. After suffering with diabetes, I have lost 15 kg. Uh, so I am taking medicine and now patient is uh, so taking some units of insulin and something like this. So is this patient not? Yes, he is also 27 plus. Before diabetes, diagnosis of diabetes, just imagine he was 35. Now he lost his weight. Uh, okay, he's taking medication. So what do you think about this? Maybe this patient is LADA or patient is 1.5. We must rule out this autoimmune impact in, in such a case. 
uh, you means in the beginning patients more bit obese. Patient then, lose weight after suffering with diabetes. Yeah, this kind of patient, in fact, in morbid obese, poorly controlled patients are very common. In the beginning, they may be 100 kilo, uh, maybe 60 years ago. Then when they are poorly controlled for a few years, they might become the 70 kilo. Then when the patient becomes 70 kilo, are they still worthy for surgery or not? Yeah, uh, yeah. BMI may be 26, maybe 27, yes. This is my question. Uh, yes. in, uh, in fact, it's still related to pancreatic function. But if you look at this kind of patient, when they from morbid obese to become mild obese or even become overweight only, in so quick times to do so much weight, it means the patient uh, has poor, very poor control diabetes in this short-term stage. In this short-term period, he lose so much weight because of glucose urea, even severe macroalbuminuria, make him lose protein and the fats and sugars from the body. So he lose a lot of weight. So it means that the patient's beta cell function drop very quick also. So in this kind of case, you must be more careful. If the patient is like in the beginning 100 kilo, then five years, he's still the same. Then I think his beta cell function mostly is still okay. But in this kind of losing weight very quick, most of the patient will downhill the beta cell function very quick. So if the beta cell function, CPAP are less, still less than more than one, then uh, the patient's organs still well preserved. I will still recommend patient to have surgery. It's good. And again, any patient, uh, so C-peptide will be our criteria. Till in such a case that already lose uh, 35 to 27.5 or 26, but C-peptide is if one plus, so definite he, uh, this is due to this weight loss was due to poor control of diabetes. And after surgery, there it, surgery will be fruitful for the patient. Yes. So uh, I would say uh, C-peptide level for me is still definitely the most important factor because uh, Without beta cell function, what kind of you do, no matter what kind of surgery you do, don't work on the patient. No matter you do bypass or not, okay? Yeah. So uh, the determined factor still how the patient uh, can react to your surgery. So we don't do, because metabolic surgery is different with surgery. surgery. Metabolic surgery patient, they lose not many weights, but their goal is for diabetes remission. So I think, Beta cell function is still a very important factor. Yeah, excellent, sir. So because these are sometimes we facing such a situation, and at that time, so what what will be our decision? So C peptide, in your opinion, and also fasting C peptide is the key, especially for selecting our surgery. Yes. Sir, patients who are suffering the long time with diabetes, sometimes we face such a situation. Now, patient 30 years is suffering with diabetes. Is it also, yes, C peptide is okay. C peptide is now 2, 1.8. This long time suffering of diabetes is also effective on the result of very, this metabolic surgery? Uh, in fact, uh, if the patient is long term duration diabetes, uh, the C peptide is still good. Most of the patients still can get remission from your surgery. But one very important trick, uh, I think most surgeons did not notice that some C peptide, some C peptide is uh, falsely elevated, especially in chronic renal insufficiency case. Because, uh, for example, a patient 55 years old, if he has 10 years diabetes, his GFR may be only 58% when he come to you. It's not the same as 100% GFR. So when the C-peptide level now is two, in fact, the C-peptide was created from urine, from kidney. So when your kidney function drops, the C-peptide cannot be secreted out. So your C-peptide level is pseudo elevated. So for those cases, in fact, for chronic renal insufficiency patients, the C peptide is normal or even high. You still need to be notified that 
the C paper is not the true label that we want. So what are we talking about is that C, uh, kidney function is normal, C paper label is good, then the surgery definitely is good for the patient. But loss, long duration, the kidney function drops, then the C paper is normal. In fact, the C paper in fact, should be lower is uh, our expectation. So in this kind of case, mostly because right now we don't have any tool to uh, truly calculate the true C peptide level according to the kidney function. So mostly in this kind of case, I will talk to the patient, make him understand that uh, your C peptide level may be 2.5, but in fact, it's not a true level. If your kidney function only 50%, I would say your true CPAP may be only 1.5. So your surgery might don't work very well. That is what I uh, would like to warn the surgeons that you have to understand this. Sir, is it necessary or compulsory to check all of these uh, uh, metabolic surgery candidates, these patients to rule out this renal failure our overall uh, kidney function uh, and 100 percent 100 percent yeah 100 percent we have to detect that because for the kidney function is very important because uh, a lot of type 2 diabetes patients eventually they will go to the chronic renal insufficient maybe stage two three four but going to beyond the stage three mostly they become irreversible so even you treat their diabetes, they, you cure their diabetes, but their kidneys still keep on shutting down. So you have to discuss with the patient whether it's worthwhile for him to receive the surgery. The second is if you do surgery on this, uh, has been go to stage three more uh, chronic renal insufficiency, your surgery, you've impaired the nutrition absorption, especially for protein absorption. They have some protein loss from the kidney failure. Then the patient become uh, even malnutrition more. It might impair the patient's long-term condition. So I think this is essential that we have to check the kidney function. Yeah. Sir, is it uh, compulsory to check microalbuminuria? Yes, yes. Because uh, microalbuminuria in uh, type 2 diabetes is a very uh, common complications for early and late micro and macro. In fact, the presentation will be different today. So for those with severe macroalbuminuria patients, mostly they will go to stage two or three chronic renal insufficiency. And after this, even after the surgery, the patients still need the treatment of this kind of microalbuminuria too. If you did not concomitant treat the patient's condition, the kidney function is still going down at long term. So uh, to collaborate with uh, renal doctors, is also part of the collaboration team. with them. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And definite an MDT <clears throat> team that we ask always, multidisciplinary team, we must have a nephrologist and this is our teamwork. So this then we must rule out any type of renal failure, then definitely there will be better results. So regarding retinopathy, because our microvascular uh, complication we can ask, are side effects of this uh, diabetes. One of this is retinopathy, as well as coronary yes. arteries. Is it also compulsory to uh, routine checkup of these cases and for follow up? So maybe now a, a stage is patient is suffering with this after six months, we can check. And also I will ask this question in your data, have you any follow up or not at that time? Definite I will ask. So if, are you agree to routine checkup of ophthalmologist uh, uh, in fact, all the uh, diabetes complications after metabolic surgery or before metabolic surgery, the patients should be screening very well. Uh, because of retinopathy, most of the patients are uh, unaware about these problems. And they just complain of some, or recently I have some vision uh, disturbance. If you did not ask them, maybe they did not describe to you. Then the kidney problems, most of the patients don't have any idea about that. And microvascular problems like the leg numbness or some uh, neuropathy problems, most of the patient also, when you did not ask these questions, mostly they also are not aware of that. In Taiwan, we have diabetes care systems. So this is very essential as our government requests all the patients when they go to the clinic, they have spontaneous to do the screening 
for retinopathy, for kidney problems, for metabolic profile for all the patients every three months. So no matter I do the surgery for them or not, they have to follow this. Even diabetologists, they will do this chest for them. So I think that even the patient having metabolic surgery after that surgery, they still can have the downhill of the disease still because not every patient can get full remission. Some patients have partial remission, some have full remission, some is only improvements. Even some patients don't respond to the surgery. Then if you did not follow up the patient, the patient has some recurrence or when the patient somewhere again, the patient diabetes come back, then you did not follow up, then I think the long-term result will not be good. Yeah, so sir, so much thanks. And I think most of our question has been answered, especially regarding uh, patient selection. Now we will talk in this session, in this part about technical points. We are interested to hear from your side, which technique you prefer, especially the patient, low BMI suffering with diabetes type two. If you have any video or if you have any presentation, please, sir. Okay, I would like to show you that about uh, my uh, small presentation, okay? Okay, sir. I can see. Okay, you can see that? Okay, great. Uh, in fact, I more prefer doing this uh, loop DJB for our patient. Uh, there's a few reasons. Uh, we have uh, performed this procedure almost about 10 years. Okay, uh, we have done this uh, for, and also report a few uh, uh, results already. Uh, we compare with bypass in the metabolic surgery patient. In the one year, they have no difference in the weight loss and glycemic control and comorbidity resolution. And two years, in fact, we have proven that it's a very effective procedures and significant reduce the weight and also resolution of comorbidity. But in fact, when we compare with rule wide bypass, in fact, has less complication compared with because of the less dumping syndromes and also less uh, marginal ulcer. In these procedures, we don't have these issues. And uh, this procedure has a very good increasing results. We has been published in the book. Uh, if you look at the surgeries after uh, three, uh, one month and six months, you will see after surgery, the patient's glucose drops very quick after OGT test. And what happened to them is, in fact, the patient after six months, you can see the area under the C-peptide curve that increase a lot of insulin production. But before surgery, the insulin production is much less compared with the post-operative. So zero months, one month, and six months, the patient has much improvement in the increasing levels. Then greening uh, drops also very significant. You will see after surgeries, the patient greening drops to very low levels. So it means the sleep component makes a lot of help in the weight loss. And uh, zero P1 enhancement is very significant immediately after operation. So from uh, preoperative, you will see the C peptide is at 13 minutes after OGT is quite low. But after you do the surgery, you are going up very quick and uh, was uh, uh, much improved. So there's been some report about these procedures. The, like this uh, was uh, published by the uh, Japanese uh, surgeons is talking about additional effect of DJB on glucose metabolisms with sleep getrectomy or not. Okay, so compare with the sleep alone, you will see sleep getrectomy plus DJB can show an early increase in the serum insulin followed by early decrease in blood glucose compared with sleep. Uh, getrectomy group only. So it's very similar to our study in our humans. And they also showing that the expression level of, of glucose transporter one and the sodium glucose core transporter one, mRNA and proteins are all increased greater in the elementary limb compared with uh, sleep alone, okay? So in fact, they thought the addition of DJB on the glucose metabolism is because of increased expression of the protein and mRNA in these uh, two transporters. This is about the uh, uh, animal study. And then uh, another one is, you know that blue-white DJB uh, Kasama is doing has been uh, about uh, five years earlier than the loop DJB. 
So when there is some surgeon doing the randomized control study compared with loop DJB and versus root-wide DJB, because loop DJB has only one osmosis, the surgery should be easier. And uh, long term, we want to see whether the patient benefit from this procedure. So this showing that the result for the weight loss, in fact, showing is better, and the medical cost is less. So he thinks that the loop DJ was better and then white DJ for especially for type two diabetes. This is one year's follow up for loss of BMI from twenty seven point five to forty cases. And uh, in some, uh, this is from uh, India results two uh, two years to showing the long two years result of safety and feasibility. Okay, so uh, for uh, one year and three years. So you will see 66 cases till three years. Their HB1 is still very low from 7.79 drop to the 5.58. So the complete remission is about 46% at three years. Then uh, totally remission from complete plus the partial remission about 54%. And uh, some patient can have only improvement. So, more than 50% for the remission is in the, this study. In our patients, previous we have reported for five years, totally about 200 cases. <clears throat> so you will see uh, mostly are female in our analysis. Length of stay only 2.4 days after surgeries. The mean age is about 47 years old. So let's uh, accept the diabetes. Diabetes almost 100% because we use this procedure in almost only in diabetes patients. The patient also have some hypertension, hyperlipidemia, hyperuricemia, et cetera. So mostly the obesity comorbidities. The BMI you will see there's a, a wide uh, spectrum is mostly in the BMI less than 30. Then some cases 30 to 35. Then mostly the morbid obesity, I did not use the loop DJB for the cases. So this is many uh, metabolic surgeries. So the body weights after surgery, preoperative is about 81 kilograms. Then after one, two, three, four, five years, the A, the weight after one year is almost very stable. There's no much difference in the long term. The BMI is very similar from 30 in average after one year to five years, only about 22. 22 is the very ideal body weight for Taiwanese patient. Taiwan uh, BMI range is the normal range 18.5 to 24. So 22 is very ideal one, just in the mid middle line for the BMI. Then excess weight loss achieve about 90% after one year. So it's very stable for these procedures. <laughs> Five years reoperation rate, only about 5.6%. In fact, reoperation re is very low. So reoperation mostly because of reflux issues for sleep complication. So very rare to see the other complication from the duodenal jejunal bypass. How about the uh, preoperative, the patient use uh, OHA. Mostly OHA use is about 70%. After surgery, <clears throat> then there's 20% use insulin plus OHA. Some patient did not take uh, medication for that, or only 2.1% use insulin only. Now, almost 100% of the patient is diabetes. So HB1C from preoperative 8.8, .8, then after five years, it's about 6.6 .6 in average. So you will see the uh, HB1C after one, two years is very similar, not much uh, fluctuation too. Then how about the uh, remission rate? It's about 68.5% is complete remission, then uh, plus partial remission, then 26.6% is improvement. Only 5% patient did not uh, react, respond to the surgery. So the surgery is, is very similar to the Indian report. It's about, our, with about 70% till five years, still have uh, complete plus partial remission for that. So this is a video for the loop DJB. I'm going to show you how I do it, okay? Excellent, sir. I want- Excellent. Really yes. great, excellent. Okay, so mostly I, uh, doing the sleep is very similar to all the surgeon that are doing right now, your sleep get me. Uh, we use 38 French uh, 
OG tube to create the Getri tube. And I do most is four centimeter away from the perils. So you will see, uh, we did not do a bigger sleeve. In fact, the sleeve is the same as what we uh, generally do it, okay? So we're marking the resection line, four centimeter from the pyros and make a transverse marking to be sure that insecure area was not the strictures, okay? Then uh, after the marking, uh, we can start to transect the stomach. To be sure that the uh, insecure area to be wide enough, okay? This is the sleeve part. Then after this, we will do a counter traction sutures. Then we start to do the duodenum dissections. My skill is a little different with the other surgeon doing the DJV. I don't sacrifice the peripyloric vessels. And so mostly I create the retro duodenum tunnels with the uh, hook. Then uh, I use a suspension tap to pass the retro duodenum tunnel to help us to having the suspension to counter truck and use the curve tip, the staple, then to enter the space and easy to approach to prevent injury the posterior of duodenum. So we transect the duodenum, then check the breathing to be sure that we did not make an injury, okay? So after this, we will go to the DJ fractures. Then we will bypass two to three meters of uh, uh, BPDM. So the first thing is that we will do a fixation sutures to the uh, pyros and the jejunum. Then uh, ask the assistant to do the contraction. Here, we are going to open a 1.5 centimeter duodenum to an enterotomy in the jejunum, then help us to do a side to side anastomosis with continuous sutures. Uh, my habit for the anastomosis use 3 uh monocryo one layer continuous sutures. So this is, uh, no matter it's a Ketri bypass or the Odino jejunal bypass, this is my routine. Okay, so we did not dissect the peripyloric uh, vessels. You can see the duodenum is very pink color. The, there's no any ischemia problem. So this is my favorite uh, skill. Okay, so we can continue to do the suture with one suture from the back to the uh, front. Then. Uh, we can make the knots. Then uh, we will cut the previous uh, traction sutures and then check posterior. Is any problems? Okay, anterior. And of course you can use the uh, airlic test or use the endoscope to check the anastomosis. I think that is more safe for most a surgeon start this procedure first. Then we make an anti-torsion sutures, okay? Then we'll cross the prison defect. Okay, uh, after this, we will uh, make, put the one drain. Uh, before the drain placement, we will uh, do a fixation of the sleep tube to the retro pattern to prevent the torsion of the sleep tube. Okay. This is our standard, okay? Then uh, we take out the liver suspension sutures to the hemostasis. We put a drain in the retro uh, duodenum tunnel to the sleep edge, okay, for monitoring or the bleeding. Then we can finish the operation, okay. So this is how we do the surgery. Sir, excellent, excellent. Sir, personally, I have a lot of questions. First question, so regarding your technique, that is the duodeno jejunostomy. This is like a sadi, but in sadi, that is duodeno ileostomy. In your technique, this is duodeno jejunostomy. So, how much this will be BP limb? 
have you any standard or it will change to patient to patient okay <clears throat> uh in the beginning we routinely do two meters uh, bpd but now because every patient's bowel limbs are uh, different. So right now, after a few years development, right now we routinely count all the bowel and keep 3.5 meter in common limb. So if the patient have six meter bowel, it's mostly commonly uh, bowel length in Taiwanese patient, about six meter. So if the patient is six meter, then commonly, but we want to preserve 3.5 meters. So the uh, BPD will be 2.5 meters. So mostly the BPD is around two meter to 2.5 meter. Sir, as, as we have studied this uh, vanillastomosis gastric bypass, uh, so okay, this is the uh, vanillastomosis gastric bypass uh, uh, in duodenum, and we are doing this with small pouch with the gastric. But the studies show, so this micronutrient deficiencies and when BP limb will be more than 200, we have a lot of studies now. And if, and especially this is in morbid obese patients, <laughs> not in uh, class one obesity. Just imagine a patient with BMI 27, if we will bypass 250, uh, so definitely you are doing this and you have showed your uh, data and your results. So what is the percentage of your patients so suffering with hypoalbuminemia or micronutrient deficiencies? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> we always treat uh, loop DJV patients as the gastric bypass patient. We give the same nutrition supplements. Okay. So they still, some would develop iron deficiency. Some of them still can develop some diarrhea. But frankly speaking, the complication in malnutrition and some like the dumping syndrome cause diarrhea is much, much less compared with sketchy bypass procedures. Uh, I would say OAGV versus one osmosis, the DJV, in fact, they are different procedures. Very important thing is there's pyros in the DJV procedures. Yeah. Yeah. The pyros <clears throat> make a lot of difference to pre prevent the food dumping to the small bowel very quick. I think that's very important thing. The second is uh, duodenum, we preserve the first duodenum. So there's still bio buffering for the tissue. So in this almost 200 cases, we never see the ulcer issues. But uh, in OAGB and ruin white bypass, they still have more marginal ulcer over that. So I think that is the very important uh, difference. Then uh, we have, uh, a few cases, we also ever have a scientific reports about uh, convert get treat by convert get treat bypass to uh, sleep DJV because of the patient have severe dumping syndromes. Then after conversion to loop DJV, the patient's that uh, dumping syndrome totally gone. You don't have suffer from the dumping syndrome anymore. So I think the diarrhea issue and malnutrition issues. Uh, it can happen more in the gastric bypass patients, but loop DJV, they can also have, depends on the patient, how they support the nutrition. If they support the same way, I think uh, the loop DJV has less iron deficiency, less protein uh, insufficiency, and also almost less no dumping syndromes. So we never see the marginal ulcer issues compared with gastric bypass procedures. Sir, I agree. But the no. supplements should be the same. The supplement of micronutrition and vitamins are the same as get you bypass. Sir, absolutely, I agree regarding this. So when we when we preserve pylorus definite, then there will be less chance of marginal ulcer, till less chance of bile reflux. Uh, so, but my question regarding this micronutrient deficiency. So this is like so aggressive and this is the main component of this surgery is malabsorption. Uh, and just imagine in a thin patient that uh, obesity class one, so a 27, if we bypass 250. So uh, again, I, I yes, I understand we, we have some benefits. If we compare with Ruan Y, we compare with vanastomosis gastric bypass, definite we have some positive point in DJ, in dedono jejunostomy because we are near to physiology as compared to OAGB. 
so but but again my concern person when we uh, we cannot decrease the bp limb so in such a case so bp limb must be 150 have you experience or no must uh, be like 350 so you save this common channel and remaining must be bypass i i think why we eventually decide to uh, make a 3.5 common limb is because we have a few cases the patient lose weight then gain some weight. Then we find the patient have a long common limb because of in the beginning, we did not count the of hours. So some patient can have eight meters per hour or even nine meters per hour. When you bypass two meters, the seven meter common limb made the patient have very poor GLP-1 react. The effect of the GLP-1 increment is not good enough. So make the patient's satiety is not there. So the patient was have some, after two years, have some very regain issues. So when the very regain issues come up, the patient diabetes become poor control. So right now we routinely do 3.5 meter. I would like to say that I'm not sure about uh, the other countries like uh, uh, Western country or like in Middle East, a patient will, how they respond. But in our patient, I would say till now, Almost 200 cases more. We don't have any case need a revision for this because of malnutrition, zero percent. So just now you see that two, that some cases need a reoperation in the five years. We don't have any case need a revision because of malnutrition. Yeah. So I think for Taiwanese patient or East Asia patient, I think to do this procedure, I think this patient they are tolerable. Sir, how long time you prefer for these patients to supplements for one year, two year? Have you any criteria? All life, all life. The same as get you bypass. You need a whole life take a multivitamins. They must take this one. Yes, yes. Sir, another, so if we compare with SASI, so personally I am also doing SASI. Also I am doing staple SASI that I placate the stomach, maybe you watched any video in social media. So this is step unless. So I placate stomach and also attach this, uh, uh, mostly this is jejunum, not ileum, about 180 to 200 from uh, treats ligament. So attached to entrum, that is a step unless sassy, we call it. Uh, but excellent results, patient not lose weight 10 to 15 kg, but stopped. So now I am following five to six years, my patients no weight regain till there is duodenum is open, less micronutrient deficiency, and diabetes is also controlled. Yes, definitely there was patient selection. So my question, have you any experience to add this loop to duodenum without stapling the duodenum? Just a loop to duodenum. Okay, uh, frankly, I don't have this kind of experience. I just come back from India. I listened to Michel Garnier's online talk about the use mechanic to do yeah. that duodenum ileum osmosis by mechanic okay yeah. he also did not cut duodenum but he used in the sleep gastrectomy patients yeah. did not have good weight loss then uh, he do that without cut uh, duodenum then the patient still lose weight in the first three months the patient lose weight very well I think that is because of very like a sassy procedure or sleep with bipartition. The foot partially goes to the distal ileum very quick, induce the good GLP-1 enhancement, make the patient have good satiety. But I personally, because in my practice and also in my previous uh, scientific study showing that uh, to do the duodenal jejunal bypass with duodenum transition is necessary, so we routinely do like this. Whether we can initiate this kind of non-cutting duodenum bypass, maybe, maybe. During that, uh, uh, Michel Carnet's talk and also your experience, I think it's maybe one of the uh, future uh, new procedure for us to think that we did not cut. Because cut duodenum for a lot of surgeons is very difficult. It's not easy and more dangerous and has some bleeding issues might happen. So I think uh, I can consider of that, but I personally, I still don't have experience over that. Uh, sir, why I'm asking this? Because as I know, personally you, you are our innovative surgeon and always do 
something new for a betterness of uh, humanity. Because if just imagine if we will do this uh, duodenal loop elastomy, so you can then there is no issue for BP limb. Okay, you will save your common channel. Just you will add this loop that is more physiologic because you saved your pylorus. There is less chance of this uh, uh, marginal ulcer and many many things that already. But again, when we will cut, not you, so myself or someone uh, new surgeon when they will staple duodenum because I see many times this yes I not personally you but many this uh, duodenum part is cyanotic and we what will happen what will happen to this because initially I remember about 10 years ago I think in 2013 I did some case of Saadi and also I follow you at that time same your surgery but all of my duodenum was cyanotic and so this, this discoloration, so you can't believe I could not sleep. So anytime when I see a telephone from a hospital, oh my God, this is a leak. Any pain, so then I think I did maybe 10, 15 cases. Uh, so then due to this, my concern, so this is the color of duodenum and so what will happen? So if we add just this loop to duodenum, maybe it will be more physiologic, just that you can do and Hopefully in future, we will see such uh, innovative surgeries from your side. Okay, I will try my best. Yeah, yeah, sir, I, I have many questions, many questions from our uh, viewers, uh, Dr. Marcillo. Uh, his question is, any concern about uh, ecteria, uh, ecteris and pancreatitis or cholangitis? due to cholelithiasis with duodenum exclusion exact i read his question i think i think it's very similar to the gastric bypass that yeah. you exclude the duodenum so if the preoperative the echo show the patient have goes on i will routinely do lab uh during this operation to avoid the future if there is cholelithiasis into the cvd you cannot approach that I think that is important. So routinely in gastric bypass procedure and sleep with the duodenal bypass, I think you have to do it. Sir, you routinely remove gallbladder in all of your cases? Only in Wisconsin. Uh, with gallstone? Yes. Yeah, 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 with gallstone definite. Yes. Gallstone definite. Uh, sir, regarding your this, uh, especially this your technique that already you have, so uh, because you have mentioned already, so how many cases in your study, in your study, how many cases were suffering with recurrence of diabetes? Have you any data? How many, excuse me? Again, they suffer with diabetes, recurrence of diabetes. Recurrence? Yeah. About 5%. 5%, 5% about 5% they don't respond to it or have some recurrence. No, no, you have highlighted in your that diagram, 5% was not good response. Yes. So my question, recurrence, yes, response, remission, complete remission, not improvement, but after three year, four year, so now a patient is suffering with diabetes again. Okay, you means uh, without, uh, in the beginning it's remission or partial remission, then they have recurrence. Yeah. It's about 3%. That is about 3 And regarding that 5%, that was less response to your, uh, this uh, surgical treatment. So what do you think? What was the uh, issue so they don't respond? Is there was, we have not ruled out LADA, we have not ruled out in these, uh, this autoimmune impact or other reason? What was the reason? Mostly, mostly still the poor beta cell function in the beginning. So in the first uh, about two years uh, patient, we don't so do so strict select. So we still have some C peptide, maybe about one, maybe 0 0.9, or 1.2, these kind of cases. In fact, they don't respond to our surgeries. So mostly this kind of patient is because of poor beta cell function. So that's the reason why right now we have more strict selection for this case. The patient lose weight because of your surgery, but don't respond to you to, to the diabetes remission. So it's not worthy at all. 
So right now I would uh, select patient more strictly. Okay, sir, any of your patient after surgery face DKA, DKA or no? After if, you, if your patient selection is good, then there is less chance no. of DKA. You means after surgery? Yeah, yeah after surgery, deep after surgery. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we don't have case because after surgery, first three months, the patient intakes quite low. So in fact, to make them to become very severe hyperglycemia, DK, in fact, it's very rare. And the second is we follow up in this kind of case is quite intense. First week, come back. First month, they have to come back. If poor control, they have to come back every month. And those who, uh, in the beginning, if you still have quite severe hypoglycemia, we will still give them medication treatment. So we don't face any patients to get the DK after surgery. Yeah. Sir, now, because definitely you are a figure and also dominant figure in metabolic surgery at the globe, after this uh, about two decades experience of metabolic surgery, now in 2020, what is the main concern of Professor CK Huang after metabolic surgery? What is your main concern when you do this surgery, this do you know jejunostomy? This loop, do you know jejunostomy? What is your main concern? Okay. Uh, I think uh, we still did not go to the core, the center of what we are doing right now. As a surgeon, we still make a lot of sacrificing for the patient. You cut a lot of stomach, you bypass a lot of uh, small bowel to make the patient lose weight and also gain some benefit in the diabetes remission. Uh, you will see that there's a few problems. The first is the patient come to us very late, especially for metabolic surgery patient. So there's been a lot of criticizing, say why endocrinology don't send the patient to us. Uh, yes, in Taiwan the same. Most of the patients go to dietitian uh, go to the medical treatment, go to the endocrinologist, then uh, they will tell them that, tell the patient, say, to go for surgery is dangerous, uh, make a lot of complication, don't go. But they still poor control. So when they come to us, sometimes it's kidney failure, sometimes it's uh, retinopathy, sometimes they cannot walk anymore, they have a lot of leg ulcer. So we treat them in the late stage. So how to offer the surgery in early, early stage, you will see, in early stage, the patient get a much better remission, of course, number one. Number two is our surgery right now still did not go to the core of the treatment, I think, in diabetic uh, remission because we still see some patients don't get uh, good results. The second is we do too much damage to the patient. This is what patients are worried about. Whether we can offer one surgery much less uh, complication and also less nutrition issues and even reversible for them. They make them can benefit much more from this surgery. I think this is what we have to do for our patient. Right now, we still cannot, frankly speaking. Then uh, still have some complication happens like a leak, like uh, strictures, ulcers can happen. And Number three problem is that we did not unify it to a few procedures that really can be announced to the patient, say, this is the best one for your patients. Yeah. We have so many different procedures. So patient are, right now is very confused about why there are so many procedures because we still did not unify to one or two procedures for that. Even there is some consensus or some uh, statement from the society. But because you would see, if you do the bypass, you see the bypass, there's some drawbacks, there's some complications. If you do the not switch, you are scared about the nutrition issues very much. So even, and even though, you know, just sleep did not work very well in this kind of metabolic surgery patients. So we don't have very good procedure right now to tell the patient, okay, go for this. This is the best choice. Even the society cannot over because we still don't have much time to prove something is one of the best or one is better choice. We cannot. So that's the reason why a lot of surgeon events, a lot of like SASI procedures by partition. I think that's the surgeon's problem. We still did not go to the core. 
Yeah, absolutely agree, sir. Really, so much thanks. And in my opinion, this was one of the best session. And personally, this is no doubt. Personally, I have learned a lot in this session. Uh, sir, any message for our youngsters who are just now going to start bariatric surgery or newcomer in this field? I think uh, I have to this job for 20 years. Uh, there's always something new happen every meeting, every year, every month. Uh, I think this is very uh, new entity in general surgeries for surgeons. Uh, if you are very uh, keen to learn something new and you want to help this pandemic problems patient, I would say right now, most disease are coming from obesity problems. So if we can treat them, mostly we can prevent a lot of long-term problems. So as a surgeon, I encourage a lot of general surgeons to get into this field to help more patients. I would say, uh, even we do more, the patient still a large uh, populations. So we are just co-workers with the other physician to help this kind of group patients. So uh, eventually we need more and more surgeons to go into this field. I believe that this is very important for all the surgeons future. Sir, excellent. Sir, just a last question because this is from our viewers. Uh, Professor Michele, Bernate Lim, his question is about uh, when you start uh, this GLP-1 derivatives like uh, viraglutide or something after surgery, you see, okay, the response is less. Is it necessary to start? Have you any experience for your patients? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have tried GLP-1 agonists for two years already. For uh, mostly it's not uh, for uh, metabolic surgery patient, mostly for bariatric patient. Uh, some patients did not uh, respond very well uh, after surgery or had some weight regain, like insufficient weight loss of some weight regain issue. You can use GLP-1. In fact, you can uh, add about 10% uh, excess weight loss more. So, But the problem is that when you stop the medication, the patient have weight regain again. Yeah. So this is the drawback of medical treatment. So for those who have uh, insufficient weight loss or where we can, we give the GLP-1 agonist treatment if the patient responds, then the patient don't want to continue whole life. We would recommend the patient to receive revisional surgery. So it's about the 40% patient can accept to receive the revisional surgery after GLP-1 agonist use. So I think that's my recommendation. But uh, as you know that GLP-1 agonists are going to combine the other hormone therapy together, it would be more effective. So this would be kind of very important tool for surgery in the future. Sir, so much thanks. And really it was a great session. And also for our viewers, it was fruitful. Definitely it is fruitful. If you have any question, my viewers, you can ask in comments and the professor will respond. We will continue this series of metabolic surgery in low BMI diabetic patients. Next week, Tuesday, Again, we will be with another legendary surgeon. We will be with Antonio Torres at 10 p.m. Dubai time, same time. So because Taiwan is little midnight today, it was 7 p.m. of Dubai time. But routinely this interview is 10 p.m. Dubai time. So next week, Tuesday, we will be with Professor Antonio Torres. And then we will continue this series. So much thanks for your support. And due to your sports, my viewers, so we, I can, I am able to continue this interview series. Sir, again, so much thanks and really appreciateable. Have a nice time, sir. Thank you very much. So much thanks. Bye. Sir. Bye, sir. So no much. problem.